And so open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 51. On this Memorial Day weekend, I thought that this particular message would be very fitting for us as we think about those who have given their lives so heroically throughout the centuries for those of us as Christians to emulate and to follow. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 1. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Is that you? I'm just asking, is that you? Yes. You seek after righteousness and you seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. You could use the word remember as well as the word look. Uh, the word means to uh, with awe and with affection to remember and look back at what God has done for your forefathers. And specifically he says, look what God had done for your father Abraham. Look what God had done for your mother Sarah. Remember the rock from which you were hewn. Remember the pit from which you were digged. Remember where you came from. Remember what you were like before the Lord delivered you, before he saved you, before he redeemed you, before he brought your fathers out of Egypt, in particular to Old Testament Israel. Remember what you had before God delivered you. And I think this is good advice for all of us. I want to take that word, remember, and I want to go back to the books of Moses. And I want to read for you and show you where Moses told the children of Israel to remember. So let's go back first to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 3. All of these passages will be from the books of Moses. The first one, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 3. Moses speaking to the children of Israel. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For thy strength, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. So number one, Moses reminds the people to remember the day of deliverance. Remember the day of deliverance. If you are here today as a born-again child of God, you may not remember the date on the calendar, but you remember the day when Christ saved your soul. You remember the day. And if you don't remember the day, then you can make this day the day that you will remember for the rest of your life. You will remember that day forever. Maybe it was a, a loved one who told you about the Lord and you accepted Christ. Maybe it was a, a friend who gave you a gospel track and you read it and by yourself, you accepted the Lord. 
Maybe it was a preacher preaching in church, or maybe you heard a Bible message on the radio or television, and God gripped your soul with your need of a Savior, and you trusted Christ. Maybe you were in a hospital room. Maybe you were in jail. Maybe you were uh, in a hotel, and you heard the gospel, and you trusted Christ. Perhaps somebody came to you individually, uh, maybe a, a mom or dad or brother or sister, and opened the Bible with you, gave you the gospel, and you accepted Christ. Everybody has their own testimony. No two of us have the same testimony. But each of us, if we know the Lord, if we came to him for salvation, we remember the day that we accepted Christ as our Savior. And again, if you don't remember that day, then you need to trust Christ today because it's a day that you will never forget. It's a day you will never forget. Whenever the Lord saves you and forgives you and cleanses you, gives you eternal life, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life, you know it. It doesn't mean that you become perfect, not by any stretch of the imagination. It doesn't mean that you no longer sin. It doesn't mean that you are always what you should be for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that at all. We are born a spiritual baby, just like there are people in this room today of all stages of, of biological growth. There are little children here. There are babies here. There are teenagers here. There are adult, young adults here. There are senior adults here at all different stages of the maturation process. So when we came to know Christ as Savior, no matter what our age, at that moment we were a spiritual babe in Christ. We didn't know a lot about the scripture. We didn't know a lot about doctrine. We didn't know a lot about the things that God has given us in his word. But we did know at that moment, we did know that we were a sinner. We did know that Christ died for our sins. We did know that he rose again from the dead. And we did know that if we would receive him as savior, he would save us. And we did so, and he did. We did know that. Amen? Amen. It's like that blind man that the Lord healed. After he was healed, the Pharisees called him in and wanted to quiz him about Christ. And they said to him, well, this man says he's the Messiah. And other people say he's the Messiah. What do you think about this? Is he the Messiah or not? And he said, I don't know all about that. The only thing I can tell you, fellas, is once I was blind and now I can see. And every Christian can say that. Every believer can say, once I was blind, and now I can see spiritually. And so remember the day of your deliverance spiritually. Don't ever forget it. Don't get used to it. Remember what you were before Christ saved you. Remember what you could have been today if Christ had not saved you. I am confident that but for the grace of God, many of us would not be alive today to talk about it. But God protected us for the purpose of saving us, sent his Holy Spirit to convict our hearts. We trusted Christ. Our life was changed. We were never the same. And though we are not all what we ought to be, thank God we are not what we used to be. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Remember the day of your deliverance. Don't get used to your salvation. Don't take it for granted. Remember the day of your spiritual deliverance. I think, secondly, Moses was saying to the people, remember the day that God delivered this nation out of bondage. Remember what God did with the plagues against Egypt. Remember how God sent Moses and Aaron to demand that Pharaoh let the people go. 
Remember how God backed up that demand through terrible plagues, including the death of the firstborn, which included Pharaoh's firstborn. And you have walked out of bondage free men and free women, never to go back. Remember the day of your national deliverance. I think as Americans, too many of us have forgotten our national deliverance. Too many have forgotten the rock from which we were hewn and the pit from which we were digged. Our founding fathers sacrificed everything so that their posterity, you and me, could enjoy the blessings of liberty. I was interviewed for a new film that's going to be coming out here in the near future this past week. And one of the questions that the interviewer asked me was, what is the American dream? And unfortunately, for most Americans today, the American dream is material in nature. The American dream to them means owning a nice house, owning property, owning nice vehicles, being able to buy nice clothes, being able to enjoy the finer foods, uh, being able to live a comfortable life financially and materially. For most Americans, that is what they perceive to be the American dream. I submit to you that that was never the American dream of our founders. It had nothing to do with owning property, having vehicles, owning a house, having financial success, money in the bank. It had nothing to do with that. Most of our founders were wealthy people. They had property. They had money in the bank. They were, they were rich people, landowners, not all of them, but most of the ones that we would identify as the founding fathers were of a, of a wealthy background. They were educated. They were intelligent. They were learned. Many of them knew several languages. Many of them were the pillars of society. They had everything that money could buy them at that time. And yet they were willing to become criminals. They were willing to become outlaws. They were willing to sign a document that made them traitors in the eyes of their government. That document was the Declaration of Independence. And in the concluding words of that document, they said that they pledged to themselves and to each other their honor, their fortunes, and their, and their sacred honor. They gave their fortunes as well as their lives. They said, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. Yeah, many of them did give their lives, and most of them gave their fortunes. Many of the men that went into our war for independence were wealthy, and they came out paupers. Many of them lost everything they had. They lost their homes. They lost their properties. They lost their families. Many of them lost their entire families. There's the story of, of one man in particular I'm thinking of who had like 12 or 13 children. When the British came to his area, they, they went through his property and his home. He and his entire family had to flee for their lives into the wilderness. They got separated in the confusion with British soldiers looking for them. Everywhere they went, well, they would have killed them on sight. The family was scattered. They got separated. The dad went a separate way. The family went another way. By the time the war was over, 
The man came back to what used to be his home. It was no longer his home. He had no longer had land. And he never saw his wife and children again. He went to his grave, never knowing exactly what happened to them. Obviously, probably, the likelihood is most of them, if not all of them, were killed. He's just one of the examples of the kind of sacrifice that our founders gave for the freedom and liberty. The American dream was not money, it was not house, it was not property, it was not success. It was liberty. That was the American dream. Freedom was the American dream. They were willing to surrender the material in the financial so that they might have liberty and more importantly, that their, pros that their posterity might have liberty. Whenever a generation lives on this soil we call earth and decides in their mind that it's all about them it's all about what they're going to get it's all about what they're the kind of house they're going to live in the kind of car they're going to drive the kind of success they're going to have when when that generation makes up its mind and says to itself it's all about me when that generation dies Liberty dies along with it. Because liberty is bequeathed. Our freedom was bequeathed to us by others who were willing to give their lives in order that we might be born in freedom. And if we are not willing to give our lives so that our posterity might live in freedom, they won't live in freedom. And I fear that we are on the verge of an entire generation of Americans. I'm, thank God we're not there yet. Thank God there are still some of us that believe that liberty is more important than money. Oh. Well, at least there's one of us here that believes <laughs> liberty is more important than money. I believe that. Do you? Yeah. I put, I put it on the line for the principles of liberty. You've seen me do it in this pulpit. Risk it all. And every column I write, and sometimes every sermon I preach, I never know what the fallout's going to be, what the reaction is going to be. But I made up my mind a long time ago. I had somebody ask me about you know, some, of the, some of the things we've gone through here as a fellowship over the last couple of months, and, I, and I, told, I told this dear man, I said, let me tell you something. I have never pandered my message for anyone, and I will not pander for anyone. As long as I have a platform, I will preach what I believe is the truth, no matter what it costs. And I believe that. I don't just say it. I believe it. And you've got to believe it too. There's a lot of people that say they believe. There's a lot of so-called patriots that say they believe in freedom and they don't. They no more believe in freedom than the neocons in Washington, D.C. or the politicians. They, know, they don't believe in freedom. They believe in freedom as long as they're able to pander the message in order to be successful. And that's what, lot, that's what these talk show hosts do. That's what these radio personalities do. That's what these TV talk show hosts do. That's what so many of these internet bloggers do. They don't say what's true. They don't study what's true and inform their message on truth and stand on truth no matter what. They put their finger to the wind to say which way the, the crowd is, is going. Which way, the, my readers and my people that are supporting me and people that are financially underwriting me. I've had, I've had internet websites that have, that have talked to me and they've said, you know, some of your, some of your columns are just, you know, kind of tough. Really? What's the problem? Well, this one guy in particular, and he named some of the, some of the people you would recognize that are supporting his web blog. And he said, 
if I print some of the things that you write, and then he named two or three of them, heavy-duty people, he said, these people will stop supporting me. And I said, and? What's the problem? And he was just silence. Oh, oh, you don't, you don't understand. I, I mean, this, this is my living. This is my livelihood. What, you think mine's not? You, you think I don't have a, you don't think I, what, you think I'm independently wealthy? I don't, I don't, I don't need to, to pay bills just like you do? Well, it's, it's okay for, for me to, to risk it all and to, for what is true. And for, uh, let me ask you, am, have I written every, anything that's untrue? Do you believe what I've written? Yes, I do. I believe you've told the truth. Then what's the problem? But all over the place, the American dream is not the truth. It's not liberty. It's material success. But that's not what it was. That's not what it used to be. And if we don't get back to the day that the American dream is liberty and freedom again, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to lose freedom and liberty in our land. Remember the day of our nation's deliverance. Remember what our founders did. Secondly, go to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I've spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. He said, secondly, remember the ones who went before you. In this particular case, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob named Israel. Remember the ones who went before you. Remember the heroes of the word of God. I hope that in your Bible study that you include the study of the biographies of men and women in the, in the scriptures. Take a person, and take your concordance, and then read everything that the Bible tells us about that individual. And not just the, the well-known names that we often think of, the names that are listed here, David and Joshua, and, and, and the great heroes that we often talk about, in which most of the space of Scripture is devoted to. But look for some of the unsung heroes and heroines. I was going back in my notes and I remember a message that I preached to you a couple years ago. In honor of Queen Vashti. I don't even remember that one. Queen Vashti would be among the many unsung heroines and heroes of the Bible. There's a bunch of them scattered throughout the scripture. Read about them. Read what made them great. Read what made them special. Read the kind of commitment they had, the kind of dedication. Read the kind of sacrifices they were willing to make. Read about the convictions of their hearts and what they were willing to risk. I think of the prophet Micaiah. Whenever the king of Israel and the king of Judah were getting together, which that was a mistake to begin with, and they were, the king of Israel wanted to go to war with the king of Syria. But it wasn't a just war. And by the way, let's, let's acknowledge that there are just wars and there are unjust wars. And God will hold us nationally and individually accountable on how we fight and whether that, that cause and that war is just and whether it's not just. And no man will be able to hide behind his superior officers and say, I only did what I was told to do. 
we are each morally accountable to our Creator God. And unfortunately, the way that our federal government is becoming more and more unjust in the manner in which it wages war Those of us who claim to be moral beings, whether we are Christians or not, but we have a fear of God, and we have a, a commitment of right and wrong, and our duty to do that which is right in the eyes of our Creator, it's putting more and more strain upon the individual heart and mind of people to want to be sure that they are not part of a, an army that is constantly engaged in unjour, unjust, illegal wars of aggression. Because there's nothing God hates more among nations than wars of aggression. Nothing God hates more. I preached a message a year or so ago. If you haven't got it, I hope that you'll go over there and find it. Julie can help you find it, and you can order it. Any of, any of these messages I've preached for the last, what, four years or so, we, all, we have a list, a catalog. You can order any of them for $5. Same thing online. You can go and you can find any of these and order them. There might be a little bit more online. I talked about the crime of aggression. Do you remember that? And we saw it in the life of King David, the anointed king of Israel, the man after God's own heart, the chosen of God. He obviously was not a perfect man, but he was God's man. And David himself, toward the latter part of his reign, decided on his own that he would go to war with a foreign government. He did not have God's blessing on that. He did not have God's calling on that. It was not a just war. It was not a righteous war. It was a war of aggression for purposes selfish to David. And David began to plan his campaign. And he began numbering his men. And that's the only reason you number men is to pl plan your war. And that's what David was doing. And God was so angry with David and his plan of aggressive war that he judged the people. And over, if I remember correctly, over 20,000 of his men were taken by God. And when David awakened to what he had done, of course, he repented to the Lord. And the Lord stayed his hand of judgment upon the nation. God would have judged Israel a whole lot harsher had David not repented of his self-will and of his crime of aggression. I tell you, with trepidation and trembling, in my soul, if our political leaders from both parties do not rid themselves of this spirit of war that has gripped the neocons and neolibs of Washington, D.C., and that pretty much form foreign policy in our State Department and in our Department of Defense. And if we don't disengage from these wars of aggression that we are creating around the world, killing millions of people in the process, most of them innocents, God's hand of judgment will no more, no more stay from our nation as it did from the nation of Israel. The neocons that are controlling this country 
I believe, Paul Craig Roberts, former Under Secretary of Treasury under Ronald Reagan, Paul, Paul Craig Roberts wrote a piece recently and he said, this is his words, not mine, he said, the neocons that are running foreign policy in Washington, D.C., he said, the neocons are insane. That's the word he used. He said they're insane. He knows many of them personally. He worked with many of them whenever he was in Reagan's cabinet. And now he's doing his best to try and expose them for the criminals they are. He went on to say that what should happen to these neocons, these ones that are waging all of these relentless wars of aggression for their own purposes, he said, what needs to happen is they need to all be arrested, removed from power, and put on trial, an international trial, for committing international crimes against humanity. So let's understand the need to be just in all things, including the way we wage war. David's a good example of when it wasn't just and what God did afterward. That's not the only example. There are many others. And one is the one between that king of Israel and the king of Judah, the story I was trying to get to. And, and the king of Judah said to the king of Israel, he said, well, are there any prophets around here that we can seek maybe the advice of godly counsel about whether we should go attack Syria? Boy. Oh, that's right, Syria. That's still in the news, isn't it? <laughs> and he said, yeah, well, he said, I've got prophets. And he had all these prophets come out. And they all said, gay hey, king, go to war. Go, God is with thee. God will give you the victory. Go to war. War. Go on, king. God bless you, man. But they all sat at the king's table. They were all paid by the king. Just like so many of these preachers in America today, they're being paid by the king. You, you, it'd shock you to know how many of the daycare centers and preschools that these churches own and operate are paid for by faith-based taxpayer dollars from Washington, D.C. And that's where the churches are making money. The people in the congregations are not tithing. The people in the congregations are not giving skin flint, stingy, disobedient, carnal Christians that won't support the man of God and the work of God in the church. They won't do it. So they don't have enough finances to pay the bills, and so they open daycare and preschool, which are very profitable businesses, and the money they get from that is, in many cases, if, if not most cases, faith-based initiative money from the federal government. So get, they're getting their 30 pieces of silver too. Isn't that a shame? The people in the church won't give and they won't support it. And so they go to Uncle Sam and get faith-based money, open a daycare center which is very profitable and that pays the bills. And on Sunday all the people come to church and go, Hallelujah, praise Jesus, we love the Lord. Isn't it great to be a Christian? That's the kind of Christianity we got in the United States of America. I promise you, that's not the kind of Christianity you get when you go to see the Christians in Eastern Europe and the Middle East and Northern Africa. They don't know anything about that kind of Christianity. So the king from Judah, he says to the king of Israel, isn't there a, another prophet maybe somewhere? Oh yeah, there's one more I didn't tell you about. Mechiah, he... He's in jail. Why is he in jail? Because he never says anything that makes me feel good. He's always negative. I don't like him. King of Judas says, how about let's bring him out and see what he's got to say. Hey, American dream Mickey I don't think, was dreaming about spending his life in prison.
But that didn't matter to him. If prison meant that's what he had to face in order to be faithful to the truth, that was what he was willing to do. He came out, told him, yeah, go, go to war. Go ahead, go on. Tell you what's going to happen to the king of Israel. You and your sons are going to die on the battlefield. Your army is going to be destroyed and wiped out, and Syria is going to annihilate you. The king of Judah says to the king of Israel, See! Back to jail he went. They went to war. What happened? The king of Israel and his sons were killed in battle. His army was destroyed and Syria annihilated the nation. Just what Micaiah said. That's, that's what we're talking about. Remember, the heroes have gone before us. Remember the heroes of our history. Study the lives of the great men and women of our country. Put away the Wii and the Xbox and the TV and the Fox News long enough to get, open your Bible and read about some of these great men and women in our own nation's history. You read about them, and then whenever you look at these politicians, you'll have a much better perspective of who they really are. Because when you compare them to our heroes of history, there is no comparison. The problem is the American people don't have anybody to compare. They're comparing Donald Trump to Hillary Clinton. Woo! <laughs> Boy! And we're basing elections on comparing this person with that person. We've forgotten. We've forgotten what Americans were really like. We've forgotten what our history is made of. We've forgotten. We don't read it anymore. We don't study it. You don't study it in school. They don't teach it in school. Go to college. You don't teach. They don't teach it. If they do, talk about George Washington and the other founders. The only thing they do is denigrate them and impugn their character. Ah, oh, they're just a bunch of slave owners and just treat them like they're trash. And so kids come out of college with no respect for our founders, no respect for our history. What about the heroes in your own life? You've probably got some. A mom or dad or aunt or uncle or grandfather or grandmother, big brother or big sister maybe, or a good friend or maybe a coach or a teacher, a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or somebody that had an impression in your life, somebody that taught you, somebody that gave you encouragement and inspiration and took your life to another level. Remember these people. That's what Moses was saying to the children of Israel. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and remember these men that went before you. Numbers chapter 15 is next, verses 37 through 41, the book of Numbers. Chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generation, and that they put on the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that you may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. That you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which he used to go a whoring. That you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Remember the word of God. Remember the Bible. The indestructibility of it. People have been trying to destroy the Bible ever since it was written. And the Bible remains forever and ever. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Religions have tried to destroy it. Back during the great purges of the Dark Ages when the Roman Church ordered the Bibles to be burned and common people could not read them, 
were forbidden by law from reading the scripture. Anyone caught with a Bible could be imprisoned or tortured. And the Bibles were burned by the tens of thousands throughout Europe during those dark ages. Throughout history, tyrants in various countries have tried to destroy the Bible. Stalin in communism, Mao Zedong in China. How many other despots and dictators have tried to remove the word of God from the, the reading of their people? And yet today, there are more Bibles in the hands of people than at any time in history. The Bible is the all-time best-selling book of history. Even in this secular, heathen-dominated society of America, it's still the best-seller. People all over the world are still hungering after the Bible, reading the Bible. I've heard the stories of people in persecuted lands whenever they, they couldn't get a, a copy of the entire Bible in their hand, many of, of the people would have sections of the Bible, like some might have copies of the Pentateuch. Maybe another person might have copies of the Gospels. Somebody else might have some of the writings of Paul. Somebody else might have the historical books. And they might have isolated uh, sections of the Bible. And then when they would come together in their, in their worship time, secretly of course, they would bring into the worship a, a, all of the Bible parts that they had. And then they would read from the various parts of the Bible that they didn't have, those that didn't. And they would share as much of the Word of God as they could. And then whenever they would leave, they would take their sections of the Scripture with them. That way, if, if the authorities came and found them and found the Bible and confiscated and burned it, they would only be burning a portion of the, of the Bible, not all of it. And people did that for hundreds and hundreds of years in persecuted lands risk their lives, risk their freedom for a part, a part of the Bible. Now today we have Christians that have a Bible but never read it. Dust all over it. No, don't read it, don't memorize it, don't absorb it. Remember the word of God. The accuracy of it. Every prophecy has been fulfilled, and the ones that haven't been fulfilled will be fulfilled when Jesus comes again. Robin, that song was perfect. Behold, he comes. And when he does, all of these prophecies yet unfulfilled will be fulfilled. But think of the thousands of prophecies that have already been fulfilled to the day, to the letter, to the T. Men writing hundreds and hundreds of years before, and that prophecy was fulfilled to the letter. Only God could do that. The inaccuracy of it, the Bible will never pass away. Read it. Study it. Pray over it. Love it. Like the little old lady was reading a Bible on a bus and this wise cracking skeptic young youngster said, Lady, are you reading a Bible? She said, Yes. He very arrogantly said, Do you believe everything in the Bible? She said, yes. He said, what about that story of Jonah? Do you believe that? She said, yes, I do. He said, come on, lady. Do you really understand that? She said, no, I really don't. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah about it. He smirked and said, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? And then she said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,
Hold it up. Let me see it. The Word of God. The Word of God. Bring it to church. The Word of God. Keep it by your bedside. The Word of God. Nowadays, it's on your computer and your cell phone, and that's great too. So if you don't have a real Bible and it's on your cell phone, hold your cell phone up. All right. The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. Give the Word of God your heart. Give the Word of God a hand. Remember his word. Fourthly, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh of Egypt. Verse 18. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but thou shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. Remember God's power. I know God doesn't always act as quickly as we think he should. And we wonder sometimes. Don't don't wonder. Our God is an awesome God. He's patient, long-suffering. But when he decides to pour his wrath upon a people or a person, there is no help that can be found in this world. Remember God's power against the enemies of God's people. In this verse, he's talking about the enemies of Israel, Egypt, and its Pharaoh. He said, remember what God did to your enemies. (laughs) He showed Pharaoh who was king. Pharaoh lost his entire army in the waters of the Red Sea while God's people went across on dry land. He proved his power to the nation of Israel. (laughs) Unbelievably, they got to the other side and got into the wilderness and started moaning and groaning and complaining and murmuring. Remember what God did to your enemies. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 9, look what God said here through Moses. Deuteronomy 24, 9. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam by the way after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. Remember what God did to your enemies. And remember what God did to Miriam. Miriam was Moses' sister. Miriam didn't like who, his, who her brother, Moses, married. He married a woman outside of his race. And Miriam was angry about it. She obviously had a problem with bigotry. That's one thing to have a a personal problem in our heart, whatever it might be. But her mistake was she began to publicly criticize Moses for it. She forgot that Moses was not only her brother, he was God's anointed servant. And God was so angry with Miriam. Numbers chapter 12, you can read the story. He gave her leprosy. God gave Moses' sister leprosy 
because of the way she criticized and maligned Moses, her brother, over the woman that Moses married. So remember, even if you are one of God's people, that doesn't give you carte blanche to do anything you want and say anything you want against God and expect that God's just going to look the other way. And I have seen these people that have set themselves against God's anointed, and it never, it never goes well with them. It never does. Anytime I see people behave in that fashion, I truly tremble in my heart for them. They know not what they do. They don't know the judgment they are inviting. They don't understand what's coming. Remember God's power against his enemies, yes, but also against his people that betray him. And, and the sacred principles that God establishes for us. Remember the power of our God. And then lastly, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. Remember, remember your history. Remember your history. You cannot remember history if you do not first learn history. You cannot remember history if you don't first learn it. You cannot understand the present without understanding the past. You cannot understand the New Testament without learning the Old. You cannot understand American history without studying the Reformation Fathers, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and others. Without studying the Pilgrim Fathers, such as Bradford and Winthrop, without studying the Enlightenment Fathers, such as Locke and Montesquieu, without studying the Patriot Fathers, such as Washington and Jefferson. You cannot know American history without learning from the men that our founders learned from. I read a, a scientific report that was put together by University of Houston political science professor Don Lutz, he went into exhaustive research to find out who were the men most quoted by the Founding Fathers. And he examined thousands and thousands of documents that were written personally by our Founding Fathers. And who did they quote the most? And he chronicled his findings and then he released them in a study. And here is what he found. The man that our founding fathers quoted the most, St. Paul the Apostle from the New Testament. The man they quoted next, Montesquieu, who taught, of course, his forte, his strength, was the separation of powers. Montesquieu was very influential upon James Madison, the father of our Constitution. The third most quoted man from the founders, Sir William Blackstone, and his commentaries on the laws of England. And number four, the, most, the fourth most quoted man by our founding fathers, John Locke, his treatise of government. We have his second treatise of government over there on the table. John Locke was the fourth most quoted man by the Founding Fathers. He was especially influential on Thomas Jefferson, who quoted from him much when he wrote the Declaration 
of independence. And when you read that second treatise of government, you're going to see how Jefferson borrowed from Locke when he wrote our Declaration. Those were the four men most quoted by the Founding Fathers. How many Americans today read St. Paul, whether you're a Christian or not? How many read Montesquieu? How many read Blackstone? How many read Locke? How many even know who these men are? We're losing our connection to our past. Exodus 1.8, now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Believe it or not, there was a day several decades ago now, but there was a day when it was not uncommon to walk into church on Sunday. I don't care what the denomination was. And hear a fire-breathing man of God telling people the truth. He wasn't a paid hireling of anybody. He was a man of God, and he preached the truth. And he let the chips fall where they may. America cut its spiritual teeth with that kind of preaching from the patriot clergyman of, of New England. And even for many generations after that, preachers were fearless, fighting men of God. And many of our leaders knew these men. They might not have all agreed with them. They may not even like them. But you know what? They respected them because of their courage and their conviction. Who do preachers, who, who do the politicians of America and the, and the TV watching Christians of America, what kind of preachers do they know today? Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, prosperity theology preachers. Preachers that don't take a stand for what is right, who pander a prosperity message to the masses and are themselves amassing great wealth in the process. Our politicians, political leaders, locally, state, and federal, they don't even know a real man of God. They've never heard a real man of God. How many Christians go to church or watch it on television every week have never sat under a real man of God? They don't even know what a real man of God is. They couldn't even identify one when they saw it. And when they see it, he's such an oddity, he must be something that we don't want to go to because nobody goes that. Everybody's, oh, everybody's going over to this church. I don't know whether you saw that. Have you watched that slide that we, it's in the rotation before the, before the service starts? Here's a, here's a, where, when the man preaches truth, and it shows four or five people out there in the audience, and here's a, when a preacher tells lies and it's a coliseum packed out. You haven't even seen that. It's out every, every week. Do you know who my wife is? <laughs> Her picture's on there too every week. We've lost connection. Lost connection. There's so few men of God anymore. There's so few that are telling the truth anymore. There's so few that are fearless promoters of truth. The people don't even know what they are. There rose up a king in Egypt that knew not Joseph. The king that knew Joseph, the pharaoh that knew Joseph, it was a different Egypt under that pharaoh because of the influence of Joseph, the man of God, in the land. 
leaders don't know the men of God. They don't know the preachers of, of, of God. It's a different country. And it's a different country today, folks. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. You're familiar with that one. The churches in America today are repeating what the churches of Germany did in the 20s and 30s. We're on the same exact track as they are. Read that book, Hitler's Cross, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The U.S. Congress and Senate are repeating what the Senate did in the latter days of the Roman Empire. And the American people are repeating what the Romans did in the days preceding the fall of the Roman Empire. The best way to preserve the future is to become an ardent student of the past. You know who said that? Me. <laughs> the best way to preserve the future is to become an ardent student of the past. And now with all the mandated transgender bathrooms and transgender locker rooms and transgender showers and boys showering with girls and boys in the dressing room with girls and boys really are the, are the teachers and principals and are the parents of the Flathead Valley and wherever you live they're watching the are you are you parents that have your kids in public schools and you teachers in admin are you really going to allow the boys and girls in your school to be in the locker room together and to shower together are you really going to allow that? Eleven states so far have sued the Obama administration over his transgender bathroom policy. But why isn't Montana one of them? Really? Do Democrats want their little boys and girls showering together in school? Really? This has nothing to do with whether you're a liberal or a conservative, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're black or you're white. It has nothing to do with any of these political polarities that we often talk about in generalities. This has to do with common decency and the upbringing character of our boys and girls. That's what this is about. I can't believe people would sit back and, and not only put up with it and endorse it, but applaud it. I'm even I'm disappointed in Donald Trump. He said, I'm not sure my mind's not made up about it. Really? Really? Come on, Donald, really? Your mind's not made up? You want the boys and girls of America to be showering together in the locker rooms together, going to the bathroom together? Really? This is hard? This is complicated? That, that was free. That wasn't even in my notes. So that's... <laughs> I'm talking about our past guiding our future. Can you imagine what America's founding fathers would have done if somebody would have suggested putting boys and girls together in a locker room or bathroom or whatever the situation was in a public environment. You know, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. I don't know. Maybe it's time about the past. Maybe it's time to bring back tar and feathering. Yeah. You read history and you read, you read things like this. Mary Draper. Ever read about Mary Draper? She assisted the soldiers who served in the Revolutionary War. She said, quote, I wanted to help colonists, but my skills in fighting were too weak. So I decided to help by melting down all of my family heirlooms. They were sentimental to me, but they are more important to the freedoms for which we are fighting. So she melted down all of the silver and precious metals of her heirlooms and gave them to the soldiers they could use for, for their muskets, lead for their muskets. What about Lydia Dara? Have you read of Lydia, maybe it's pronounced Dara? 
Lydia was a Quaker, someone whose religious beliefs prevented her from getting involved in the war, but the British found this convenient, so they felt they were safe because she was a Quaker, and so they used her house for their private meetings. At a meeting, Lydia overheard the British plan a surprise attack on General Washington and his men at a nearby camp. She personally delivered the information to Washington and by doing so saved his life. She said that through prayer she came to the conclusion that so many would suffer and die if she did not act. And thank God she did. She preserved our first president. If our pastors and Christians today were reading and studying history as they should, they could not be content to sit on the sidelines and do nothing while our nation is collapsing. I hear so many of these preachers, oh, God hadn't called me to get involved. God just called me to preach the gospel. All over the Middle East, Christian ministers and Christian people are picking up AK-47s and they're fighting together side by side against the terrorists, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and some of the others. They love God as much as we do. They love the Lord as much as we do. They love peace as much as we do. They're every bit the Christian that we are. But they know that if they don't fight, their families will be destroyed. And unfortunately, so much of that terrorism that's going on in the Middle East is funded and supported by our own government right here in the United States. But Christians are fighting for their survival, for their families. And here in America, oh, God hadn't called me to get involved. The day that America will be saved is the day when America's pastors and pulpits wake up from the coma they've been in for the last several decades. That's when America will be saved, and not a day before that. Remember. Remember the day of deliverance. Remember the ones who went before you. Remember the word of God. Remember God's power. And remember your history. Let's stand for prayer.